Welcome. We're so glad you've decided to join us in A Look Ahead. We're doing a series on the book of Galatians, and we're number five in that series. This is a lesson that many of our friends will be studying on October 29 of 2011. Before we begin, however, I think we should bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father, we, we have taken up the challenge of trying to understand the book of Galatians. There are some challenging ideas in here. Help us to understand them. Help us to see Paul's perspective. Help us to understand the Judaizers who were opposed to Paul so that we may more clearly understand Paul's arguments is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So this lesson is going to focus primarily on Galatians 3, 1 to 14. And this lesson, I will tell you, is about curses, about substitutions, and salvation by faith alone. So what do these ideas conjure up in your mind? Well, let's look at those verses bit by bit here. Let's look first at Galatians 3, 1 to 5. You foolish Galatians. Now, is that a good way to write to your friends? No. Who put a spell on you? I mean, he's saying, you know, the devil has cast a spell on you. Before your very eyes, you had a clear description of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. What does that mean? Tell me this one thing. Did you receive God's Spirit by doing what the law requires or by hearing the gospel and believing it? How can you be so foolish? You began by God's Spirit. Do you now want to finish by your own power? Did all your experience mean nothing at all? Surely it meant something. Does God give you the Spirit to work miracles among you because you do what the law requires or because you hear the gospel and believe it? So that's Paul's first, the first part of Paul's argument. Clearly, Paul was upset by the news he had received from Galatia. The Greek word in this passage, sometimes translated as foolish, is actually a word which, mean, which literally means mindless. It might more correctly be translated dumb or stupid. Why would those Galatian believers choose to do something that was that mindless? Undoubtedly, the Judaizers were trying to convince them that their salvation was not complete without doing these additional things. Furthermore, our natural selfish natures, let's be honest, would love to accept the idea that we can do something to earn at least part of our way to heaven. Wouldn't that give us a basis for boasting? I did more than you did, right? But, but is that really what's making um, Paul upset here? Or is it, you know, he's talking about two Gospels here, mm -hmm. right? One came through their own eyes, like their own experience, the when other Paul one, was with them. The other one came through the, these Judaizers' authority. I think that's what he's upset about. Yes. Well, what's it, Paul is trying to spell out what's the difference between these two. I know. I know he is. But I think, I think what he's doing is that he, uh, he, he's showing his displeasure because they're going not by their own... Um, their own experience, they're going by what somebody came in and said needs to be done. What's happened here is that when Paul was there, they were convinced he was right, and they followed him. And now somebody else came along, and they hadn't thought through very clearly what they had learned from Paul, and now he presents a slightly different message, and, okay, this sounds good, and now they're following him. Now, are you sure that he came with his own authority and, and, and did it that way? Or did he teach them? You talking he, about Paul or the other? Talking about talking about Paul. Yeah. He went through and teach, taught him. He went through the scriptures. He went through, you know, there's all kinds of stuff he could have went through to to, um, you know, persuade them. And if you got that view of it, and then you got these Judaizers come in with their robes or whatever that they're they're higher ups in the the Jewish counselor or whatever, that they start believing them just because of what they say. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think that's what Paul was really angry about. Oh, but it was more than that. The, the Judaizers came, came with the scripture. They came with their interpretation of the Old Testament. Well, it was traditional. It was very but it was, traditional. But there's a lot of that in the Old Testament, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, 
the interesting thing is this, and I would like to challenge you, because I've never heard anyone say this or discuss this before, but what is implied by the expression, before your very eyes you had a clear description of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross? Does that imply that an explanation of why Jesus had to die was the basis of Paul's gospel? No, I think it's because it's personal. You, Why, what does I think, that have to I think do you're with right. I think you're right, but I think one big element is that, that it's personal. It came to you personally. Mm -hmm. It didn't come through authority. It came through you personally. It came through your own eyes mm -hmm. type of thing. So I, I think that's a big part there, too. Well, what does it mean to have a clear description of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross? Someone told you something in detail. Mm -hmm. Trying to explain what happened, really, wouldn't that be it? And someone that spoke with authority that was there? The, the Greek word, which is translated in my Good News Bible as a clear description, is a translation of a word which means placarded or, or painted. It's a, it's a word describing a very public proclamation. Paul was suggesting that he had portrayed to the Galatians as clearly as he possibly could the actual events of Christ's death and their implications. Does this tell us that by returning away from Paul's view, they were rejecting Christ? They were starting to look at a distorted picture. Yeah. Well, Paul, Paul clearly suggested that at the beginning they had come to be Christians in a right way. Paul absolutely believed that the gospel he presented to them was the correct one. And just in case you're not sure about that, let me turn back to chapter 1, verses 7 and 9. Actually, Paul says, there is no other gospel. But I say this because there are some people who are upsetting you and trying to change the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel that is different from the one we preach to you, may he be condemned to hell. We have said it before, and now I say it again. If anyone preaches to you a gospel that is different from the one you accepted, may he be condemned to hell. Now, there's now, two ways you can look at that. Mm -hmm. You can look at it that he was just, he was, he believed it, and then nobody was going to change his mind, or he's putting out the possibility of authorities coming down to tell you the truth. And you're believing it based on the authority. So, and, but he's trying to say, I'm a better authority than those people? No, no, no. That's the whole point of Galatians. He's not saying he's an authority at all. He goes through and he, he tells a story about how he found this stuff out. Mm -hmm. You know, the stuff that he told these guys. But, but these, these guys that were just plain authoritative just said, hey, this is the way it is. Believe it or you better believe it mm -hmm. or else you're well, wrong. See, but that's the question. Mm -hmm. Would you believe Paul or would you believe them? And why? That's the question. Well, you know, that's what Satan is always trying to do. He's changing the times. He's changing the laws. He's changing the gospel. He's changing anything good you do. You find that it starts being manipulated and changed. And it's so frustrating to Paul. He had them all. Mm -hmm. This is the picture. He had it right. And people are coming along and taking him by the nose and saying, oh no, go this way. And, mm -hmm. and, they're, and they're being stupid enough to listen to a, non, a person who wasn't there. Now, now I, 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 I almost hesitate to ask this question, but I'm going to. If Paul came and explained very clearly why Jesus came, why he lived on this earth, why he died, and if you, in fact, had thought it through and struggled with the issues in your mind and you finally had got it all worked out so you really understood the truth and someone came along and tried to pervert that and give a different story, would you be inclined to accept it? Well, how about all the stuff that happened to Peter? The sheet coming down, mm -hmm. his time with Jesus and everything, but yet when these authorities came in and he looked at them, he, he moved away from the... Um, you know, the, the other guys to move over where the, the, um, the, the, Jews, the Jews are, you know, so they separated from the Gentiles right then. So, you know, it happened to Peter and he had way more exposure than any of those people in that church did. Mm -hmm. Well, you so, know, 
We're why? different. We're the different. question is why? Well, we're different people. Some mm -hmm. of us have backbone and mm -hmm. others don't. Mm -hmm. And so when, or others want to uh, be friends, if, if the group moves on and does something else, they sort of go along with the gang. And it's, it's, it's a hard characteristic to learn to stand up for yourself and what you believe in. When you're young and inexperienced and you're new at something, um, you know, there's just, it's just, you don't have enough roots to hang, to, to, keep you, you know, hanging in well, trouble. It's interesting when you go back and look at the mm -hmm. history of the Christian church, each time, for example, the story of Cornelius would be an excellent example. What happened to them after they heard the gospel? They received the Holy Spirit, right? And elsewhere it says they received the Holy Spirit. Did these Galatians receive the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Yes. I would think so. That's what we, we have suggestions of that. If you had received that kind of experience, if Paul himself had come to preach to you and you had been convinced he was right and you received the Holy Spirit, how could you go back? Well, I think that's what, that's what teed off Paul. Yeah? But Pete, yeah, Peter had clearly received the Holy Spirit at the time of Pentecost. Mm -hmm. He'd done marvelous things and then he fell mm -hmm. here in this, in, in this encounter with More the, than once he fell. Well, yeah but clearly in this yeah. time when Paul rebuked him. Yep. So just because you've got the Spirit once doesn't necessarily mean that... Doesn't mean you're infallible? That's right. Well, do we, do we ever think we're good enough to be saved? Does God grade on the curve? When we finally realize that we're not able to fully do everything that God requires, everything that God requires, do we give up? A lot of people do. Or do we humbly accept the help that God offers? You know, when you say God grades on the curve, I think God... I didn't say that. I'm well, asking. I, I <laughs> think that God takes into account some people will get better than others. But when you grade on a curve, you have to flunk as many as you pass uh, on the bell curve. And I don't think God does that because he does not say, well, I have to flunk 10% of you to make the curve be a perfect bell shape or something. That isn't the cur way the curve works when I was in school. <laughs> that, was, that was a way so that, you know, when, when the exams were too tough and the material was too tough, I didn't have to achieve 95% to get an A. Mm -hmm. I, I could get it with 85%. But on a curve, don't you have to flunk no. some people? No, well, if that's the curve one, has that's no one version of it. That, that, that's one, one way to interpret it. But oh, no. okay, okay. My, I mean, when I was in school, the idea was I had some teachers that were, had some really tough classes, and their version of grading on the curve was whoever got the highest mm -hmm. score, that was set as 100%. And everybody else, because they figured that's as good as a student can do, and the rest of the people would, would be graded down from that. Oh, you always disliked those people that were always up there at the top. They ruined <laughs> the curve. Yeah, that's right. These, yeah, these, these guys in... Guy in, I had it's a guy in physics that made 107 percent on everything all the time. Oh, so rather they had to they had to really adjust the curve for the rest of the class. After that, <laughs> to the rest of the class, that's what's really That's right. Bad. Yeah. Well, getting back to our subject, do we sense <laughs> in any significant degree the actual sufferings that Christ went through on the cross? We believe that he died the second death, don't we? The death of separation from God that results directly from sin. He experienced what it means to be separated from his father by sin. That's why, of course, he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The terror and pain of that experience was so bad that his physical pain was hardly felt. Those are the words of Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 753. What, what, what is that experience like? What is that when you're... Well, it was so bad that having been crucified, having wearing a crown of thorns, having been ripped to pieces by all that beating in his back, those things were hardly felt. The Garden well, of Gethsemane know, was next to death too. Yeah, exactly. What was so bad, the stress was so bad in him that his body started oozing out blood, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that's tremendous pressure. And that's before inside. anything else had happened to him. Yeah. He hadn't been beaten or anything yet. Since we are separate from God, unless we choose to mm -hmm. go closer, how can we even understand? Yeah. 
if if God died the death of the sinner, at the second death at the cross, why didn't he burn up? Well, that's a good question. Is it is, is burning the second death? Does that mean that the Sodom and Gomorrah, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, suffered the second death? We don't believe that. I don't certainly believe that. I don't believe burning is the second death. I think that Jesus died the second death. The people who are going to be burned up at the end, according to Isaiah 66, verse 24, are actually dead bodies. They will have died of sin, but then the fire is the cleansing. And Ellen White specifically says, the cleansing flames will clean up the mess. So the second death isn't burning. Second death is not burning. Separation from God without burning, yes. like, like Jesus said on the cross. Yes. So when, if I'm one of these people that ends up suffering the second death. Let's not do that. Then that, what's that going to be like? You're going to be... It's going what to be what is this awful. going to be, be like to be s separated? It's going to be very, very bad. Yeah. When God first gave the sacrificial system out the, outside the gar gates of the Garden of Eden, it was probably clear to Adam and Eve that the intention was to show that sin leads to death. How long do you think it took before the people began to get the idea that if you have enough lambs to offer, you could sin almost freely. How many of the people sacrificing lambs throughout the history of the Old Testament really understood what that was supposed to mean? By the time of Christ, they had turned the sacrifice of lambs into almost an indulgence system. So, now we come to one of the no second, another one of the big questions in this section. How was the question of substitution represented by the sacrificial system? Oh, can you break that down into common everyday language? Yes. yes. <laughs> Many people believe that the way God saves us is by taking our sins and putting them on Jesus. So he dies as our substitute. Similar to what we discussed in the last lesson about uh, the courtroom's experience yeah. where you take all the guilt and put it on the innocent person. Yes. Well, and the sacrificial system, you know, my, my sins were put on the lamb, and mm -hmm. then the lamb's killed. Mm -hmm. Isn't that okay. true? Yes. Theoretically. Yeah. And the sins are placed, scattered on the temple, and then, you know, at the end... The Carried out by the high priest and placed on the scapegoat. Right. And we and put scapegoat. it all on the scapegoat, which we often interpret that the devil, and he goes out in the wilderness. And it's, that's a very concrete way of trying to teach people that God wants to separate them from their sins. Right? Mm -hmm. Or is there something more implied? Is there a sense in which Christ's righteousness... Now, see, we, we've talked about my sins being taken off of me and putting on the Lamb. Okay? Now I want to know about the other half of that equation. Does the righteousness of the Lamb now come on me? Lamb righteousness, is that enough? I'm asking. And can you actually transfer my sins to the, to the Lamb? That's, can you make an animal guilty for your sins? Now, some people say, well, don't worry, because God takes our sins and buries them in the depths of the sea. And that's... It's, that's suggested by the Old Testament and the Minor Prophets. The difficulty with that is, if that's true, what about all the sins of the saints that are described in Scripture? What happened to them? Did God go dig them up out of, the, out of the bottom of the sea and put them in the Bible? See, if all traces of sin are going to be erased at the, at the second coming, we're going to have to have that one giant Bible burning outside the New Jerusalem. I mean, is that what's going to happen? all those records, and then why, <laughs> why have all these thousands of years of dealing with this sin problem if ultimately God's going to wipe it all away? Yeah. If there's no lessons to be learned, and, and uh, for the record, I don't, it's... But we have suggested that the life and death of Christ give us a choice. We can agree to live a life patterned after His life, or we will die the death that results from sin as He died. 
So how do we actually accept by faith the death of Christ on our behalf? How do we accept his gift of life? Well, so far as the letter, so far in the letter to the Galatians, Paul expressed his absolute confidence in the gospel he had presented to them. He made it clear that his gospel was approved and given by God himself. And furthermore, it was later accepted without change by the brethren down in Jerusalem. That's described there in Galatians 2, 1 to 10. He then proceeded to talk about the personal experience of the Galatians themselves, and that's, of course, verses 1 to 5. Paul turned next to discuss the biblical or Old Testament basis for confirming his gospel. He focused on the story of Abraham and its partial fulfillment when the children of Israel came out of Egyptian slavery. God's promise was fulfilled. The children of Israel had nothing to do with the plagues of the deliverance from Egypt. All they had to do was march out. Or, or did they have something to do with the plagues in Egypt? Did, were some of the plagues brought by Moses or by some of the children of Israel? or Who brought the plagues? God did. God did. Who was that who, who, who made all these arrangements, finally ended up killing a large part of the Egyptian army? Was that the children of Israel or was it God? It's God. It was God. So, there's, an excellent there's excellent evidence suggesting that Paul was the first or earliest writer of the New Testament. So when he talked about evidence from Scripture, who, what's he talking about? The Old Testament. It has to be the Old Testament. In his very last letter, which is what we call 2 Timothy, he said that every inspired, that is, God-breathed, Scripture is profitable for many things, uh, for many things. It goes on and tells what it's good for. The apostles and disciples repeatedly referred to the Old Testament to substantiate their beliefs. Is that a valid argument? Valid argument for what? Use to the support Old Testament? your beliefs. Yeah, yes. using your Old Testament. Oh, yes. Well, here's well, what Well, it didn't work very well for the Judaizers. Well, they thought they had the upper hand because they were using these biblical arguments. But Paul says, I can do you one better. Now look at his argument and see, see what you think. Is this a valid, can you follow his logic? This is Galatians 3, starting with verse 6. Consider the experience of Abraham. As the scripture says, he believed God, and because of his faith, God accepted him as righteous. Now that, of course, is Genesis 15, verse 6. You should realize then that the real descendants of Abraham are the people who have faith. The scripture predicted that God would put the Gentiles right with himself through faith. And so the scripture announced the good news to Abraham. Quote, through you God will bless the whole human race. And of course that's Genesis 12 verse 3. Abraham believed and was blessed, so all who believe are blessed as he was. If we have faith, remember faith is the same as belief. So those who depend on obeying the law live under a curse. So there's assurance there. Paul is saying, you know, if you believe like Abraham, then you're going to be blessed too because you, you can, we know Abraham. You saw how he was blessed. You believe that he believed. If you believe like he did, then you will be blessed like he did. Yeah. Are you saying that we are <coughs> spiritual children of Abraham? That's exactly what I'm saying. Those who depend on obeying the law live under a curse. Now, try to imagine the Judaizing friends who were probably present in Galatia when this letter was read. Do you think they felt like they were under a curse? No. No way. For the scripture says, whoever does not always obey everything that is written in the book of the law is under God's curse. Now it is clear that no one is put right with God by means of the law, because the scripture says, only the person who is put right with God through faith shall live. But the law has nothing to do with faith. Instead, as the scripture says, whoever does everything the law requires will live. That's Deuteronomy 27 verse 26. But by becoming a curse for us, Christ has redeemed us from the curse that the law brings. For the scripture says, anyone who's hanged on a tree is under God's curse. Christ did this in order that the blessing which God promised to Abraham might be given to the Gentiles by the means of Jesus Christ, so that through faith we might receive the Spirit promised 
by God. Well, it sounds in this passage as if God, if Abraham, if Paul is uh, intimating that um, that the Old Testament is not valid, or at least using that as a pattern for your life. Wh why? Not sure why you think. Well, that. because he's saying here um, that uh, you're under a curse if you. If you if you try and do what the Old Testament says here, the Old Testament says if you don't do this stuff, then you're under a curse. And yeah. so it's like he is, he's almost saying, you know, the Old Testament says if you don't do this, you're under a curse. So if well, you don't do it, you're under a curse. Well, how they do it is kind of a question, isn't it? Yeah. Whether you're you're. Mimicking the law or doing it some other way. Let, let's is, is Paul saying that the, since Jesus came that there's a better way? Yeah, there's a better way than the Old Testament. All that Old Testament stuff wasn't really a very good way, even though I gave it to you. But Jesus has come along, so now you've got a better way than all that Old Testament stuff. That's the new dispensation, right? Well, I don't know what, what it's called, but... Uh. <laughs> what Leviticus 18.5 says is, follow the practices and the laws that I give you. You will save your life by doing so. I am the Lord. But that implies you have to f obey all the law all the time. And Paul's saying, <clears throat> since you aren't going to do that, you're not going to save yourself by obeying the law. So why do you think Paul was making such extensive use of the Old Testament? He's quoting many different scriptures here. Well, that's what the Judaizers were using. Exactly. <laughs> they were quoting lots of places in the Old Testament. Paul says, I can, I can, I can throw a punch for punch on that one. <laughs> have we ever been tempted to think that our works might have something to do with our salvation? What do, what do we mean when we say that we are saved by faith alone? Is it important to recognize that we can't be saved by our works? Well, I can tell you from personal, my personal experiences, when you don't have this to guide you, this body of knowledge, this understanding, somehow it seems as if there is a natural, and maybe it's the devil moves in there, and in the absence of, you know, of, of this good body of knowledge, he just has, can move right in there. But it seems almost as a natural instinct to think you, you can, you know, I can remember as a, as a, as a young person, mm -hmm. there were certain th thinking, well, something turned out right in my life, so maybe if I do that again, then uh, things will get, to, you know, it'll, it'll be better. Are you, and, and are, you, are you trying to suggest that we're naturally selfish? Well, about selfish, just... To think that uh, I mean sa Satan is the ultimate selfish one. Just somehow there, there seems to be a, a very natural pro propensity to come to the conclusion that if you do things, mm -hmm. that um, the powers that be, whatever they are, will respond to you. Will find favor. It will. Mm -hmm. it, things will work out for you, and and. Really, my, my my theological approach there would be: what is happening in there is there is an absence of God's influence in your life, and so the devil can move right in and mm -hmm. persuade you. It's not necessarily some evil thing within in you that causes that. And I may be wrong in that theological understanding, but somehow I think that's what it is. I don't think it's a natural instinct to do that. I think. There's an absence of the influence of goodness, and the devil can move right in there, and that's what one of the things he wants. He, it's one of his greatest tools is, the, is to make you believe you can do things to, to save yourself. If, faith, if salvation is by faith alone, does that have anything to do with evidence? Yes, it's all to do with evidence. Well, if faith is an experience, a relationship, <clears throat> then you know from that relationship, um, you have you have evidence from that relationship. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's all you have. It seems to me. It seems to me in my life there have been times when all of the all of the well scientific data is the wrong term, but 
all of the facts of the matter seem to go against yeah. what my what my my conscience, my experience uh, yeah. leads me to believe. Well, we, we live in a day and a time when almost everything has to be proven. I won't believe it unless you show me. Yeah. Show me the money, you know, all that kind of stuff. History seems to define truth as tested hypotheses, uh, statistical analysis, etc. Do we have a hard time believing in someone we cannot prove or disprove by scientific investigation? Well, even people in the Old Testament did because like that guy that put out the fleece, uh, several times in the Bible people wanted actual evidence, but you don't get that all the time. Well, I'm not using fleeces. Well, my it would be nice with every decision to put out a fleece and see what the decision is. and. But uh, evidence isn't always something like putting out a fleece. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't physical. I, it may be something that you've learned from. Yeah. The, for those evidence. scientists yeah. that are listening, I don't. I don't mean to be critical of, of science and scientists, but it does seem that those who are strongly inclined towards scientific um, um, reasoning and thought is that if you cannot prove it scientifically, then. Uh, that's the only way to prove it. Mm -hmm. uh, now maybe there are certain uh, behaviorists and psychologists and I don't know what those kinds of people say well no you know human emotion and thought and experience but we certainly live it would be my sense that we we live in an age in which uh, there is a preponderant a preponderant inclination to believe if you can't just you cannot go by what you feel inside, mm -hmm. well, you know, and you got to be careful because that can leave you, you know, in a James Jim Jones situation. Well, but, it seems uh, to be a generational thing because we were taught that way and we think that way, <coughs> but the younger generation they're being fed Harry, um, Harry Potter and yeah. uh, we, uh, these uh, teenagers that have uh, supernatural abilities. They can zap people or go flying through the air. And the young people, it seems like, are getting away from science and going more into uh, fantasy. You know, and it, it seems to me, and I, I want to be careful how I, uh, this is my perception, I don't know if it's accurate or not, but it does seem to me that uh, the generation that's coming along behind me uh, doesn't, behind? Doesn't, doesn't seem to, uh, not that far behind, <laughs> doesn't seem to, um, it seems like their approach to the religious experience uh, is less more of of exploring this book than um, kind of doing kind of doing things their own own way. And if there's some listening to this, I hope they're not misunderstanding what I'm saying. Well, let's let's tie an example. Do you have a hard time believing the story of Abraham? Do you think Abraham lived the life of faith? What about the times when he lied about his wife? Considering that there are real differences in cultural, cu culture and living circumstances between us and Abraham, can we learn anything from the life of Abraham that might help us to live better lives in our day? As you read the story of Abraham, what sticks out in your mind? His faith relationship to God or his obedience? I mean, he left his homeland and his family to travel thousands of miles into an unknown land. Think about the facts that he, the facts that he was willing to be circumcised, and he was willing even to sacrifice his son at God's command. What kind of obedience is that? Doesn't that seem like? I mean, doesn't it look like, you know, God said something and Abraham says, "I'll do it." Well, that, that that looks pretty impressive. But that was. I think Abraham was smart enough to realize that was a ludicrous thing for God to ex ask him to do, was to take his son up and offer him as a sacrifice. But it was because of his re was because of his relationship, mm -hmm. because of the the relationship and understanding and the intimacy that he had with God. Um, we say today that maybe he knew that. You know, God wouldn't really do it or whatever. Have him do it. He'd step in there or something. But it was. A, it's my. It'd be my. My. My interpretation that it was his relationship and understanding with God that he knew when he went up there that it wasn't just blind obedience. Mm -hmm. It was. He had some kind of a relationship there that he knew 
that he could trust God in this situation. So in this argument, Paul took the offensive by focusing on Abraham's faith as opposed to his obedience to law keeping. Do you think Abraham considered himself a friend of God? Yes. If you're not a friend of God, would you dare to say to him, I'm quoting now from Genesis 18, 25, surely you won't kill the, he's talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, surely you won't kill the innocent with the guilty. That's impossible. You can't do that. I mean, talking to God like this. If you did, the innocent would be punished along with the guilty. That is impossible. The judge of all the earth has to act justly. Does that sound like two friends talking together? Mm -hmm. Sounds Doesn't like <clears throat> Abraham understood God better than we do. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. In that it wasn't about Abraham. So what do those words in Genesis 15, 16, we've looked at before, what do those words stand for? Abraham put his trust in the Lord, and because of this, the Lord was pleased with him and accepted him. What do those words mean? Those words have been repeated numerous times in Scripture. Apparently, people thought those were important. So what does it mean to count or reckon or impute righteousness? Do we ever have righteousness credited to us because of our obedience or our faith? What I think is kind of interesting <clears throat> is that God started with individuals, Adam and Eve, Abraham, individuals. And then God moved on to groups of people. Mm -hmm. And he's trying to expand the groups of people to do the same thing that the individuals did, Abraham. Mm -hmm. um, why, why do I have to be, have righteousness imputed to me? Why do I have to be made right? Why do I have to? Well, probably it's because I mean, I've got, I've got my relationship. That takes care of everything, doesn't it? Why do I have to be? Well, if you have a proper relationship, it will take care of everything. So but why, it changes, why it phrase, changes you. Why does it even phrase yeah, that way? Because the relationship, a, why? A scale sitting there. Yeah. And if you're a little bit heavy on one side, mm -hmm. you're not going to, you know. You have a, if you have a relationship, you don't have to have anything given to you. It's just there. I see. So why do you well, have Well, is there a relationship between faith and obedience? Well, uh, that all falls into line when you have a relationship with I God. See. You don't have so to worry about. We're not saved by works. We don't, we don't want to go there. We're not saved by faith plus works because that's also a no-no. Is it still true that faith works? Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, relationship does show faith and obedience because I saw this this little girl and and she had parents, and she, they she was doing things for the parents and having just a delightful time doing that. Now she had a relationship with the parents. She trusted the parents, she was obedient, and it was her joy mm -hmm. to pick up the items around and help her parents with that. And I think the relationship uh, showed there was trust there and, and then there was obedience there. So maybe it's a triangle that when you have a relationship, you start having trust and you start having obedience. Okay. Well, our, emphasi our lesson emphasizes that we are saved by what Christ has done for us. What about what the Holy Spirit is doing in us? Is that also good news? Amen. What happens when we study, pray, and meditate on the life of Jesus? Does it change us in some significant way? Remember our quotation from Great Controversy, by beholding we become changed. It's a law of the human mind that by beholding we become changed. How many times and in how many different ways did God reveal himself to Abraham? Did, you know, I wondered, you know, if you hear a voice in the middle of the night and it says, take your son out three days journey and kill him and don't bother to tell your wife, what would you do first? Would you find a psychiatrist? I mean, what would you do? Well, if it's a voice I've heard before. And that's the, the question. Did, did Abraham recognize that voice? Well, I think so. I think he, I think, I think he, he had to, I mean, yeah, he'd heard this many times before. Come mm -hmm. out, let's look at the stars. Mm -hmm. Let's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to bring you a child. I'm going to, you know, and of so course, on. Of God so could on. obviously have used ventriloquist techniques. He could have changed his voice any way he wanted to. But clearly no, he apparently there's, wanted... There's no inference no. in the past. No, I mean, clearly he wanted Abraham to know it was him speaking, right? It may not just be the tone of the voice, but what it said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I don't just know Myra by her voice. I know it's by what she says, how she looks, and so on. Mm -hmm. It's uh, yeah. Based on modern ordinary thinking, we would suggest that Abraham did several very crazy things in response to God's commands. He took off, you know. He took his son, etc. Would you leave your home and leave, travel to the other side of the world because God spoke to you? There are at least three things we can learn from Abraham's you know, faith. One, one, yeah? one question I have. Um, during that time when Abraham was asked to sacrifice his son, was this really out of the ordinary of religions at that time? There were apparently some religions doing that, but for very different reasons. But still... Reasons was, that Abraham would not have bought for, for at all. But still, it required a sacrifice of a son. They thought they could... Sometimes this kings and others like that who had lots and lots of sons would sacrifice a child to, so, to quote, appease God. Do you ever think that he might wonder if he would ever do something like that and to prove himself to be as loyal as that king would have been? Well, clearly Abraham had a personal relationship with the divine. Are we open to God's voice in our lives? And how many different ways does God speak to people? Can God speak through nature? Yes. Myra, you Definitely. suggested that. Through impressions? M Myra, when you see all this death you know, all these, everything eating everything else. In the ocean, everything eats everything else. You want them I just watched my dog catch a rabbit this morning. It, it was not a happy scene, although I don't mind getting rid of a few rabbits in my yard. <laughs> I don't like to see the rabbit die either. It's part of the circle of life. I've also watched a baby being born and go, how can people not believe in God? I well, it's an incredible thing. Does God speak to us through Bible study? Absolutely. Through counsel from our friends, maybe. Or even signs, dreams, or, or visions. Does God's directions to us always seem rational? Has God ever directly communicated with you? Even before Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees, God had promised him that he would be the father of many nations and a blessing to many nations. How long did it take him take for that promise to be fulfilled? A long More than 25 years. What's interesting is I would really like to know how Abraham saw God, spoke to him, mm -hmm. because I don't, I can't even imagine if Abraham knew God like I knew God, if I heard go out in a tent and leave your family and all that. Mm. You know, there had to be something. You said back in the Old Testament, things were different. Yeah. Abraham lived in a tent his whole life. All the life we know about, anyway. I think God has a tendency to show up to people who will listen. Mm -hmm. I kind of think that's a, a prerequisite. Mm -hmm. so okay. I think he tries to communicate with all of us? Well, I, I think... Um, no, how shall I should say that? I, I think he will show up in, up in person if, he th if he's pretty sure that you'll listen if he shows up in person. Yeah. And if he's listening, if, if uh, obedience comes from the Greek word... Obedience is hupakoe. Which means a willingness to listen. A humble, humble willingness to listen. And if you're listening, you're responding. You're doing the things you were asked to do or not doing the things that are, you're asked not to do. He shows up and will communicate with you at the level with which you're willing to accept that. And he hasn't shown up in front of me that I know of, so I guess I'm kind of condemning myself, saying if he did show up, I probably wouldn't believe it was him, but, or her, or it, or whatever. But it's that interesting is. that in the story of Abraham, God kept saying a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit. Would that be progressive revelation, or might we even call it present truth? We could call it education. That's what you do in school. You go a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Does each of those pieces of revelation nullify what God said to him before? No. 
it still builds. When God, so that would be the second point. God gave gradually increasing, a gradually increasing revelation, a closer and closer relationship with, with Abraham. Three, when God finally said to Abraham, I will come back next year at this time and you will have a son, what was Abraham's response? He laughed. And Sarah laughed. Yeah. Hadn't God already set conditions on his covenant? If you go back to, you know, we say, no, God, no conditions, you know, God's going to do everything, whatever. But God, Abraham, I mean, God has said to Abraham, quite clearly, um, back in chapter 17, You must also agree to keep the covenant with me, both you and your descendants and future generations. Your descendants must all agree to circumcise every male. From now on, you must circumcise every baby boy. There's quite a list of requirements here. I will keep my promise to you and to your descendants and future genders as an everlasting covenant. I will be your God and the God of your descendants, and so forth. Is so. God conditional today? Well, what about that? Abraham had a lot of failings spelled out in the pages of Scripture, and he chose to believe God when God said astonishing things. And God, God called Abraham his friend. The final test before the onlooking universe was proof that they were real friends. Abraham trusted God, believing that anything God asked him to do was finally, ultimately, for a good reason. It is significant to notice that God asked, didn't ask Abraham to promise anything. Four times, God said, look, look at Genesis 12, 1 to 3. The Lord said to Abraham, leave your country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to a land that I'm going to show you. I will give you many descendants, and they will become a great nation. I will bless you and make your name famous so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, but... I will curse those who curse you, and through you, I will bless all the nations. That was five promises, five blessings. Mm -hmm. And who did the promising? God. Completely one-sided. He didn't ask. Now, there are conditions, come on later, but at the beginning, God said, I promise, I promise, I promise, I promise. If you go and leave your relatives and... Yeah. Now, do, do we all get tests like Abraham had? Uh, in greater and lesser amounts, are we all... Well, let me give you an example. We talk about an old covenant and a new covenant in the Bible. Do you remember what the old covenant and the new, Testament and the new covenant consist of? People, the Israelites said, all the Lord has said we will do. They Look promise. at Exodus 19.8. This is the old they. covenant at the foot of Mount Sinai. We will do everything that the Lord has said. And God says, I, I'm not sure you understand what I said. Let me try again. You come over to chapter 24 in, in Exodus. And you come down to verse 3. Moses went and told the people all the Lord's commands and all the ordinances. And all the people answered together. We will do everything that the Lord has said. So Moses writes it all down. He says, now, now let me read it to you one more time. And then he took the book of the covenant, verse 7, in which the Lord's commandments, commands were written, and read it aloud to the people. They answered, we will obey the Lord and do everything that he has commanded. And what happened six weeks later? Dancing, drunk, Dancing. and naked around the golden calf. Yes. Were they obeying all the commands? No. So this older covenant... This one based at the, at the bottom of, of Mount Sinai was who doing the prom promising? The people. And if we go back to the, the covenant that Abraham, that God made with Abraham, who was doing the promising? God. God. Do we know anything about a new covenant in the Bible somewhere that might tell us something more about that? Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31 is sometimes the passage which is often referred to as the New Covenant. If you look at Jeremiah 31, verse 31 to 34, notice what it says. The Lord says, the time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Talking about that one we just talked about at the foot of Sinai. Although I was like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant. The New Covenant that 
I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach their fellow citizens to know the Lord because all will know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. Who's doing all the promising again? Well, God promised clear back there before he took them out of Egypt. He said, in well, Exodus 6, yeah. I'll be your God and you'll be my people. I'll do all these, all these things for you. Well, and, and way back to, in the days of Abraham, we already read that. Right. Yeah, exactly. I would rather have God promising than me. You think that's a better plan? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <clears throat> well, if God does all the promising, is that an example of cheap grace? We hear people sometimes talk about cheap grace. Is it not only cheap, is it free? But it cost everything. God has put everything on the line for it. It's free to us. How many of you have heard stories about people who have promised God almost anything? You know, they're in the foxhole or they're in the whatever. God, if you will just get me out of this mess, I will, da 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 Who's doing the promising? We are. How often do human promises work? Mine never have. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want to give a personal testimony? Yeah. Well, I can't remember specifics. I just know I've learned my lesson. Yes, okay. And I just don't promise anything anymore. So whose promises are reliable? <laughs> it's God's promises. <laughs> what would you do if you got a message from God in the middle of the night to take your miracle son, the one through whom God had promised to raise up entire nations, three days journey into the wilderness to sacrifice him? Well, the case of Abraham's faith was clearly more than a one-time acceptance of God's plan for him. Abraham had to take it step by step by step, right? Well, what do you think of Paul's friends who were so proud of the law they were promoting? Though they, when they read, uh, what do you think they thought when they read Galatians 3.10? Did they in any way, remember 3.10 is the one that says anybody who believes that, that follows the, the law is under a curse. Did they think they were being blessed for, for their obedience or did they think they were being cursed for their obedience? Blessed. Do you remember what it says in Deuteronomy 27 and 28? Then Moses, together with the leaders of Israel, said to the people, Obey all the instructions that I am giving you today. On the day you cross the river Jordan, and he goes back, he says, Do this, do this, do this. And Moses took the priests up there, and they started going through a whole list of curses on disobedience. And there they are, spelled out in chapter 27. And they end up with the message that Paul uses in Galatians, God's curse on anyone who does not obey all of God's laws and teachings. And all the people will answer, Amen. Hmm. But then there follows chapter 28. If you obey the Lord your God and faithfully keep all His commands, what does that sound like? That I am giving you today? Doesn't that sound like obedience? Yes. He will make you greater than any other nation on earth. Obey the Lord and so forth and so forth. Is it any wonder that the people of the time thought that the rich were blessed by God and the poor were cursed by God mm -hmm. and must be sinners? Mm -hmm. Do you suppose the children of Israel ever thought that those curses in Deuteronomy 27 applied to them? When obeying God, do we have the option of choosing and picking out what we want to obey? Can we count on God to overlook a few mistakes here and there? Or must we recognize that our best efforts will never accomplish what needs to be done? So in what sense, as Paul suggests, did Christ deliver us from the curse of the law? Look, look at verse 13, Galatians 3 again. But by coming a, becoming a curse for us, Christ has redeemed us from the curse that the law brings. For the scripture says, anyone who's hanged on a tree is under God's curse. So, in what sense is Christ, did Christ become a curse for us? Well, did Christ hanging on the cross demonstrate the natural results of sin? Weren't we the ones supposed to be there hanging on that cross? He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Didn't Christ take our place? Did he actually die the second death for us? Would it, be a correct, would it be correct to call that a substitution? 
or was it primarily just a demonstration? Well, one of the little known facts in the writings of Moses is that virtually all of the Ten Commandments are followed later in the writings of Moses by death decrees for each of those commandments. Are those death decrees still valid? I hope not. <laughs> Should we be stoned if we pick up sticks on the Sabbath? Remember the story in Numbers 15, 32 to 36. Well, are any of our sins intentional? Look at, the, look at the verses just before that. But any person who sins deliberately, whether he's a native or a foreigner, is guilty of treating the Lord with contempt, and he shall be put to death, because he has rejected what the Lord said and has deliberately broken one of his commands. He is responsible for his own death. Our Does that sound like a very gracious God? Maybe they just had very liberal interpretation of the law. <laughs> <laughs> a liberal? Well, maybe it's not quite as, maybe we're, we're in error and strict in interpreting it to be quite as strict as we are. So, what are we supposed to see with this uh, substitution? What are we supposed to, what's supposed to be thinking about when we think about substitution? Well, look at the, try to look at it from the Jews' perspective for a moment. Can we begin to fathom why the idea that the Messiah would come and die a cruel traitor's death seemed completely unfathomable to Jews who believed in the prophecies of the Old Testament. Surely the Messiah could not be cursed. It was not his curse. It was our curse. So what really happens when we exercise faith? Is there an honest sense in, what, in, what, in which faith is a kind of leap? Is it only a safe to leap if God has promised to catch us? Or is it only safe to leap when the one who tells us to leap has gone over the path before us? Moving forward in the dark is only safe when you have a reliable guide giving you instructions. It is never safe to leap on the dark side, in the dark, with no guidance. The terrible struggle that Christ went through on the cross, and even before that in the Garden of Gethsemane, is spelled out in considerable detail in Desire of Ages 7.53 and 7.56.3. And how did Christ win? We are told specifically he relied on the evidence heretofore given him. That was the world's greatest example of faith. See you next week.